We're considering the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus, things about Jesus you see in the miracles that he did. Now the scope of salvation, by that I mean uh, salvation is like a large field, very large. And its scope is uh, a lot more than than uh, is ordinary, ordinarily perceived. It involves more than getting you out of trouble or getting you free from guilt. These are involved, understand, but this extends far, far beyond that. All right. Glory would be a rather boring affair if all we had to remember was we were forgiven. If, that was, <laughs> if there was nothing more than this. But there is a lot more than this. That's the beginning, praise God, and, uh, but it is just that. Uh, Christ's earthly ministry, it introduced us to the manner of the kingdom. It introduced us to how God works, how He thinks, where He goes, what He sees, what He's moved to do. You'll notice also in His miracles describe both the private and public nature of salvation. There are certain aspects of salvation that's very public. It has to do with the assembly and and a, a congregation of people and this sort of thing. It also is very private, as we're going to see in this miracle for tonight. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law. It's interesting, isn't it, that even though Peter was married and had a mother-in-law, perhaps a family, we don't know, he never, he never talks about this. Isn't that it? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> you can got to take that wherever you want to take it, but it is, it is intriguing, to say the least. Uh -huh. He myself, uh, a family man, this is sort of provocative to think about this, that this wasn't where his thoughts were centered. Although it's very obvious he was intrinsically interested uh -huh. in, his, in his family. So it's just something to consider. <laughs> I'm going to read the three gospel accounts of this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of them cover this event. Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15. When Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid, or laying down, and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and ministered unto them. Mark, first chapter, verse 29 to 31 reads, Forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and a nun, or immediately, they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Luke 4, 38 and 39 reads, And he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. And they besought him for her. And he stood over her, and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and ministered unto them. Quite an event. It pays to have Jesus come to your house. Amen. Now let's notice this occasion. This followed up the synagogue. They'd just been in the synagogue. Both Mark and Luke tell us this. Mark says they were when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Luke says he rose out of the synagogue and entered into the house of and entered into Simon's house. So it immediately followed being in the synagogue. It's interesting that some people, when they attend quote the synagogue of our day, they sort of go every place else, but. Uh, except where Jesus might go. It's a sort of an interesting phenomenon that's arisen. But they went from the synagogue, Jesus went straight to Simon's house. You ask yourself, would he come straight to my house? You ask, you've got to ask yourself these, these sort of questions. Where would he go? There's a sort of a, what I would call a continuity in kingdom life. It doesn't like abruptly end and then next Sunday picks up again. It's not, it's not like that. Spiritual life isn't by fits and starts. It's not by a switch, turn it on and turn it off. 
you uh, work real hard for a certain hour or segment of time, and then you revert back to your ordinary manner of living. <laughs> this is not the manner of kingdom life. It's not how it works. <coughs> Jesus uh, lived out spiritual life before the eyes of people. And here's what he said about his life. John 8, 29. He that sent me is with me, and the Father hath not left me alone, for, this is, so listen, let me tell you something. There are people that think God's just automatically with them all the time. They cite these, I'm with you all the way to the end of the world. Let me tell you something. There are some people God's not with all the time. Mm -hmm. Jesus tells you why the Father was with him. Uh -huh. Wasn't just because this is a formality. For, I do always those things that please him. Amen. I will tell you right up front. That if you don't live for the Lord, don't bank on Him being with you. This is not going to happen. That makes any difference to me what people think about this. A person who lives without a consciousness of God, God is not with that person in the sense of this text. And no amount of scripture quoting can put Him there. God does not reside where He is not served. That's one reason why he confined his presence to the tabernacle in the, among the Jewish people. That's why. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he spells out to us how we, how we live. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now see, Jesus lived this out. He goes from the synagogue to Simon's house. They didn't, uh, they didn't go to watch... Uh, a local athletic event, right? Some Greek, Roman, Roman games. <laughs> That's not what. When Jesus come into the house, these people are thinking about what Jesus could do, as you're going to see. They immediately connected their circumstances in their home with Jesus and His ministry. This is how Jesus is. Where He goes, He's always doing the Father's will. That's why the Father is always with Him. So the occasion, He left the synagogue without any break. In emphasis, went to Simon's house. They, he still has on his mind the Father, still walking with the Father in Simon's house. Now let's look at the place. It's a private dwelling. A private dwelling. I've noticed over the, uh, over the years, and this is, this is not something you make a law about, I understand, but just an observation I've noted over the years. There are some people who are noted for their homes being sanctified for godly use. And there are some people who are homes, as far as you know, you don't. it's just for their family, and that's pretty much it. Simon was not this kind of person. We'll find that Matthew was not this kind of person. We'll find that Martha was not this kind of person. Zacchaeus was not this kind of person. There's a number of people, their homes... Their homes were open to the Lord. And I say this to, uh, this is an area that God's people could find a lot of blessing in if they just, if they just seek this. It was a private dwelling. Matthew says it was Peter's house. <coughs> Luke says it was Simon's house. And Mark says it was Simon and Andrew's house. They were brothers. We gather from this that the, it, uh, he, Simon or Peter was a former formal owner of the house, but Andrew lived there, his brother lived there with him. You'll find this in the third world countries that families do live together a bit. It's, it's more of a practice than it is in our, in our country. A man that once worked for me, he was from China, and that was just a practice that the in-laws lived with you. In fact, the married couple took the in-laws with them on the honeymoon. This was a practice. You can imagine what the people said in America. So this was a practice, as we understand. Families were, this is the way they were. I wanted to just uh, make a, take a moment here to mention some houses that Jesus went in. They're recorded in Scripture. Houses that he was in. And it's, it's very, very edifying. Mark, the second chapter, Tells, tells us uh, about Matthew's house. Here's what it says. As he passed by, he saw Levi. That's another name for Matthew. 
the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Verse 15, It came to pass that Jesus sat at meat in his house. <laughs> so Matthew makes a special banquet, a feast for Jesus in his house. Another man invited Jesus to his house was a man called Simon the leper. We read about him in Matthew 26, 6. Uh, Luke 7, 36 says that he was a Pharisee. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> a leper. He was a leper. Simon the leper. That's what he's, what he's called. When Jesus, Matthew 26, 6. When Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. I don't know if he was a leper at that time or a former leper, but it doesn't, it doesn't say, but he was there. Luke 7, 36, speaking of the same incident, says he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So here's Simon the leper. He, he, didn't, he didn't have a heart for Jesus like some people did. This was the house where a woman that was a sinner came in. Simon didn't think this was right. And join here, people invited Jesus to their house. Here's another Jairus. You remember him. Luke this 8, chapter, verse 41. Behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was the ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet. He besought him that he would come to his house. Come to my house. Luke 8, 51 says, When he came into the house, and then he put everybody out and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead in his own house. Simon's mother-in-law was raised up off the bed of illness in Simon's house. It's a very important thing to see. Now there's another person who invited Jesus to their house quite frequently, and it was Martha, the brother of Mary and Lazarus. Luke 10.38 says, It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And this is referenced several times in Scripture, that this is... Like a stopover for Jesus in, mm -hmm. in their house. You yeah, remember, of course, on one occasion that that's where he raised Lazarus from the dead was at there. It was near their house, but it paid off to have Jesus in their house. Zacchaeus, Luke nineteen five, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. Said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for the day I must abide at thy house where you live. You know, there's a, it's possible for your house to be the last place where you demonstrate spiritual life. That, it, that's possible for that to happen. To be pretty concerned about the Lord every place but your house. I will go so far as to say this is a temptation. And uh, we want to encourage one another to make our houses places where Jesus can, can come. I want to mention some things Jesus did in houses. See, he taught in the temple, he taught in the synagogue, but some things that happened in houses. Of course, there was a healing of Peter's mother-in-law in a house. Mark 2, 10 and 11 speaks about a man who was sick of the palsy. And Jesus healed him in a house where it took place. Mark, the fifth chapter, verse 41 Jairus' daughter was raised up from the dead in a house. Matthew 26, verse 7, there was a woman with an alabaster box of ointment, very precious ointment. She poured it on Jesus' head in a house where she was. Matthew 9, 28 and 29, two blind men were healed in a house. I'm showing here that this is like Jesus' manner. Matthew 13, 36, you recall the parable of the tares of the field? Remember that parable? It was explained in a house. After when they, here's what the scripture says. Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And that's where they heard it. Mm -hmm. Heard it in a house. Luke 14, 1 through 4, a man with dropsy was healed in a house. <laughs> it came to pass that he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. 
And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him and healed him and let him go in the, in the house. Well, that's quite a blessing to consider. House. The house. In life in Christ Jesus, houses, they are sanctified in a very special way. I want to show this from, from Scripture. From the very beginning, a house, the idea of a house changed when people came into Christ. Acts 2.46 says that they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their houses were places where Christ was welcome. Acts 5.42, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You remember Cornelius? He feared God with all his house, Acts 10, 2 says. And Peter came and preached at his house, and all, his, all the people were there. Acts 12, 12. When he had considered the thing, he came... This is Peter. He'd been released from prison. When he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So how about that? John Mark's mother. This is the... Mark, that Paul and Barnabas split up over. Her house is used, people come there and pray at their house. They prayed for Peter in the house of Mary, mother of John Mark. And how about this Lydia down in Macedonia? When she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you've judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Mm -hmm. Acts 16.40. Well, let me, in Acts 16.32, this is where the Philippian jailer was converted. And it says, He believed in the Lord. He spake the word of the Lord to all that were in his house. And that whole household was, was saved that night. Right after he's released, Acts 16.40, they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Houses. Acts 18, 7. I'm showing here that the people of God sort of depended on godly households uh -huh. and homes. Acts 18, 7. He departed, Paul departed from thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. He moved right next door to the church. And uh, so they gathered there. And who could forget Philip, the evangelist? What a, man, <laughs> what a man he was. Paul in his ministry said, The next day we that were uh, they were there, uh, Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which is one of the seven, and abode with him. And the next verse said he had four daughters that prophesied. What a house that must have been. Hmm? Wouldn't that be, it'd be something for Paul and those who are with him to choose your house to come to? What a Amen. blessing. What a blessing. I'm afraid I might catch some people off guard, you know. I thought about that. You don't you want to have things so you're not caught off guard if one of the Lord's servants knocks on the door. You know? uh -huh. Be ready. So houses, they're, they're blessed. This is God's manner. Some people only associate the working of God with a, quote, church building. This is the total association. Not so. The Lord works in houses. Now let's look at the circumstance. Jesus enters, enters into the house. There's a uh, hard circumstance in this house. How is he going to react to it? How are the people going to react to it? How, what are people going to think when they've got an ill person in their house and Jesus comes to, to visit it? Well, Matthew, he accents the fact that Jesus was aware of this. He accents that part of it. Matthew 8, 14, he says, When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw. He saw. His wife's mother laid sick of a fever. So he was, he was aware of this. So Jesus, Jesus he always knew what was going on around about him. He was never caught off guard. 
If you're the disciples in a boat and there's a storm, Jesus storm. Jesus knows about it. If you're in a house, your mother-in-law is sick, Jesus. Jesus knows about it. Mark says that she lay, so she was, wasn't sitting in a chair going about just with a fever. This was a debilitating fever. It says she lay sick of a fever. So that's, the, uh, that's how Mark paints the picture. Luke, he adds a little bit more to it, how serious this thing was. He says she was taken with a great fever. So she had been like captivated by this, by this great fever, and here Jesus comes into the house. He's going to face a circumstance over which men have no power. She's taken with the fever. So they can't do anything about this. Uh -huh. There are some things you can do something about. There are some things you can't. Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities, but there's some things that it won't help. Some things if Jesus doesn't help it, it's not going to be helped. And blessed is the person who recognizes such things <laughs> and knows it. There were people in the Scripture who ministered to other people in their affliction. Epaphroditus ministered to Paul in his affliction. But there's some afflictions that can't be ministered to by anybody but the Lord. And here's, here's, here's one. You look at sickness, however slight, I suppose some people might think a fever is very slight, although in this text it wasn't. It was serious. But human frailty <laughs> produces a deep need for Christ. Some people see it and some people don't. But it's important to see it. Don't get accustomed just to living with frailty without recognizing the need for the Lord in it. Scripture accents this sort of thing. Psalm 6 and verse 2 says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Hmm. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. There are circumstances that... Uh, that require particular attention from the Lord. This was a circumstance, circumstance like that. But these are opportunities for God's power to come to play. Now Paul saw this. Paul associated infirmities and weakness with the need for divine power. This is a circumstance in which God works. Now here's what the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 12.10 Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. How's that? In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, mm -hmm. for when I am weak, then am I strong. Now the thing that occasioned that observation was Jesus told him, My strength is made perfect in weakness. Mm -hmm. That is, my strength exhibits itself when your condition is weak. This is when God's strength, so to speak, kicks in. Amen. Paul saw that. So you want to see uh, evidences of infirmity or weakness, human frailty, as occasions for the display of divine power. That's how you've got to see this. And it's according to everyone's faith how that works itself out. <clears throat> now the Lord, in uh, His strength is made perfect in weakness. It can either dispel the weakness, just get rid of it like He's going to do with Simon's mother-in-law, or it can make the person superior to the circumstance so Paul can live his whole life with this tremendous handicap and it, and it not hold him back at all. So that's, there's two ways, at least two ways, maybe more. So there we have the place as a house, not a formal setting. We have a circumstance, uh, it's a helpless sort of situation. Now, how, how, what happens when he gets there? Matthew says he saw her it's like an overview of it. Matthew, his tendency is kind of give an overview of the situation. <clears throat> the other writers, they, they take it a little further. Mark says they tell him of her. They, the people in the house. They were Simon and Andrew. They, by the way, Jesus. Uh, our mother-in-law, she's, my mother-in-law is sick of a fever. They tell him of her. Even though technically, you know, he knew. But this, the king doesn't work that way. It works by you, by you bringing it to him. Amen. I just received a, a question 
just this morning. I'm not sure if this is a younger person or an older person, but they said, just please help me with this. Just why, if God knows everything, why do we have to pray? Why do we ask? Why doesn't he just do it without us asking? He didn't see the man of the kingdom. This, this is exposing you to how God works. You're not on automatic pilot. When you come into Christ, it isn't that God just solves all your problems and you just kind of live and everything kind of works out. That's not the way it is. He brings you into the equation. You become involved in it. So they tell him about her. Luke, he takes it a little bit further. He says they, they besought him for her. So they like pled and begged and asked him to intervene. So you see these various views. Jesus is fully aware of the situation. He saw her. They brought the case to Jesus. They didn't, they didn't like count on Jesus just sort of wandering about and seeing the woman. They, they brought the case to him. And they pled the case. Besought him. Asked him to help her. You know a lot of grace is forfeited because it's not sought. Yes. People just get busy and they think, uh, think well, things will finally get better. Well, see, a lot of grace is forfeited because people don't go after it. Don't seek it. I don't know if this uh, Peter's mother-in-law would have passed away. I don't know. But uh, when Jesus is in the house, it's just best to take the case to him. Not try and diagnose whether it's serious or not. Now, what's Christ's approach to this? To this whole thing? Matthew says he, he touched her. How was that? <laughs> he, he touched her. Oh, when Jesus touches somebody. <laughs> this is not your normal touch. You remember that woman with the issue of blood? She knew that this, he cut the hem of his garment. She knew things wouldn't be the same. But just our immediate contact with Christ alters the whole situation. So Matthew says he, he touched her. Personal involvement. Personal. Jesus is not a formal Savior. He's a personal Savior. Well, Mark says it a little, he goes a little further. He says, he took her by the hand and lifted her up. How's that? Took her by the hand and lifted her up. Talk about mercy and gentle. Someone might say, well, maybe she wasn't, wasn't able to get up right away. That maybe he was expecting too much of her. Oh, but see, when the Lord takes hold of somebody, there's a power, there's a power and grace that goes from Christ to the person. Amen. So he touched her. Took her by the hand and lifted up. Uh, Luke, he takes it a little bit. <laughs> For says, he came and stood over her and rebuked the fever. So he accents the authority of Christ. Matthew accents the personal gentleness of Christ. He touched her. <coughs> Mark, he accents the fact that the Lord enters right into the thing. He took her by the hand and lifted her up. And Luke, he emphasizes the fact that Jesus is, in fact, in charge of this situation. Amen. He just like stood over it as the captain of this woman's salvation. What a marvelous picture. See, faith, real faith is persuaded of divine interest and involvement. Mm -hmm. See, here's an ex a case. Jesus dealt with it by becoming personally involved with it. He touched her, took her by the hand, lifted her up. He exerted his divine power, stood over and rebuked the fever. Now, faith is convinced that he does this. Here's an explanation of faith in Hebrews 11:6. He that comes to God must, must believe that he is. So forget about saying, oh God, if there is a God. Just yeah. <laughs> and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, faith is persuaded of this. Faith is persuaded... That no one seeks God in vain. No one asks in faith in vain. When you lay a matter before the Lord, it's not in vain. What a marvelous thing to see. Well, let's look at the results of this whole, of this whole matter. Matthew says, the fever left her. She rose and ministered. Mark says, immediately the fever left her, and she ministered. 
Luke says it left her immediately she rose and ministered. So they give a little different slant to it, each one of them. Matthew, he just takes it from beginning to end. The fever left, she got up and ministered. He just gives us kind of a summer statement. Mark says that this happened to me instantly. The fever left her and she ministered. He doesn't even mention she got up. She just went, goes right straight to the ministry part. And Luke... Uh, Luke says immediately she get left her and then immediately she got as soon as the fever left she got up started ministering serving them. So here's some things you learn from this the uh, the affliction departed yield, yielded to divine authority. When Jesus rebuked the fever it it left. See the only the only personalities or circumstances that don't rec that do not recognize Christ's authority are, are men, human beings. Angels know it, they respond. Devil uh -huh. knows it, he responds. Demons know it, they respond. Illness knows, they respond. Fig trees know it, they respond. Seas know it, they respond. The only, <laughs> the only people that don't seem to know it are, are people, human beings. Uh -huh. And uh, it's gracious that God just doesn't just run rough shot over them. <laughs> That's very gracious. Amen. But he can fully do this, you understand. He can just do like he did with the flood or Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> he can do this. But this also is not his manner. So the affliction yielded to a divine authority. The fever left her and then it was instant. You say, well, why, why, why say these things? But because if you can prevail upon Jesus to speak about your situation, that's, that's the resolution. It's resolved. That's the resolution. If you have a storm, all he has to say is, peace be still. That's the end of the matter. Uh -huh. If it's a fever there, he just says, he rebukes it. Leave and it leaves. That's the way it is. That's how Jesus is, see? What is a lot of what prayer is about is prevailing on Christ to speak and on God to speak. Just to speak. If he just says something, that's the, that's the end of the, of the critical matter. Immediately the fever left her. And the response was instant. She got up right away. She didn't allow it to say, well, I've been sick for a long time. I'm going to lay here in bed and gather my strength. She got up right away. That's God's grace. Amen. Don't expect that if you have a setback, whether it's a moral setback or whatever kind it is, don't expect that it's going to take a long time to recoup. Don't expect this for a moment. It can be instant. People are rebound right back from severe setbacks. Immediately she Amen. rose. And when she got up, the first, she went to working right away. Uh -huh. She started working right away. Ministry and serving. Maybe she gave them a meal. They went to her house after the synagogue. Maybe she served them a meal. I don't know what she did, but she, she ministered. Maybe she washed their feet. Instead of widows, and the indications are she might very well have been a widow, one of the qualifications for the church supporting widows is that she's washed the saints' feet. She's been hospitable. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. That's one of the qualifications for the church assisting the widow. And she had to be at least 60. She had to be 60 years old. And she had to had people in her house and wash their feet and minister to them. She didn't. She had to go down to the American Legion or someplace else. Yeah, this is how God operates. You reap what you sow. See, when you're young, or young married, or whatever, and you and you bless other people with your house, it pays some big dividends when you get older. Pay some big dividends. She ministered to them as soon as she got up. Now the response confirms something had really been done. This wasn't just an idea that Jesus was perpetrating. It's presumptuous to affirm that there's been a divine work if there's no evidence of it. Man, comes to say, <laughs> I hesitate to say that because it sounds so utterly simplistic. But there's a lot of people that say they're saved that don't give any evidence of being saved. They don't have any evidence that they are. They say, people say, Christ is with me all the time, but they, <laughs> there's no evidence that he's there. When Jesus does something, there's evidence. Uh -huh. Something happens. And it's blasphemous to say that Christ has done something if we don't respond. 
If you see, if Peter's mother-in-law just shouted out from the back room, "I'm healed! I'm back here! I'll be out! I'll, I'll be out a little later, but I'm healed. I'm everything's okay now. I'll, I'll see you next week." <laughs> I'm sorry. This is not the way God works. There's an immediate response, and Christ is is glorified by the evidence of His work. When this, Amen. when this fever left and she was not in a fever anymore that glorified Christ when she got up right away that glorified Christ when she ministered to them that glorified Christ he's glorified by the responses to his to his work now in, in all of these observations the occasion from the synagogue to the house the place the private dwelling the circumstance of mother-in-law sick of a fever the petition, they tell him about, tell him about her, appealing to him, and Christ's approach, he just personally becomes involved with it, and the result of it confirms Christ's nature. Let me just summarize it briefly. He's, he's all-seeing. You, you have to believe this. He's all-seeing. You will never tell Jesus something he's not aware of already, but he wants you to tell it anyway. Amen. And he's compassionate. That's the one to try straight. He is compassionate. You don't have to wonder, will he care? Will he do something? You see, you're wasting your time thinking about those. He's compassionate. And another thing about him, he's responsive. They told him about her and he did something. He's responsive to these things. And he's effective. So this is, these are things you learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. And another thing you learn about them, they came from the synagogue to the house and they, they connect they connect what they saw in the synagogue, which was the healing of a, of a man. They, they connected that with Jesus being able to address their situation. They made a connection between the two. So those who are in the presence of the Lord, he becomes the, their focus of attention. I remember, uh, I was, how old was I? I was 19, I think. 19 and I held a revival meeting in a certain town and there was a man we went to his was at his house and we I heard some sounds from the back of the house and uh, I thought it was a, a dog or a pet well as it ended up it wasn't this man had a had a son it was 24 years old and he was you could hold him, you could almost hold him in one hand. His head was the only thing that developed, and, his, and the rest of his body was just like a little baby. But, and he was intelligent, but he couldn't express himself. And there was an element of shame that the parents had about this, this boy because someone made fun of him and this sort of thing. And even at that, uh, at that young age, I sensed that Jesus is compassionate about what's in your house. You really got to believe this. He's compassionate about what's in your house, and you don't have to hide it. I wasn't uh, learned in the kingdom of God as, as I would be, at least not to the extent that I would be later, but I was honored that this man told me about this and showed me this boy. And I thought, uh, how much more? Take it to Christ and show him. 